just by making some bows. So you probably won't be able to see much of this, but just bear with me, please. Thank you very much. Okay, let us um, get comfortable, however you like to be, while sitting, while listening. Let's just take a moment to check in and, and sort of arrive here at this next uh, little chapter of the unfolding universe just being here now all things arising as they are now the great heart of the universe opening itself, showing itself, revealing itself as it is now. What a, what a joy to be able to tap into that, to know that, to participate in that now. We heard yesterday Master Nansen saying, ordinary experience is the way. Yeah, the, the words are just 1000% applicable here and now. They may have been uttered in the eighth century in China, probably right at the end of the eighth century, like seven, it must have been 796 when Joshua was 18 years old, comes to Master Nansen and asks, what is the way? This Dharma way, this path of awakening, what's, what's the awakening? What is awakening? What is the way? And Master Nansen says, ordinary mind is the way, ordinary experience, here and now, just as it is, is the way. And he's talking about here and now. These are basically words that don't really know about time. They sort of, they're just uh, utterly ignorant of time, you could say. They just don't know about time. They don't acknowledge it or know about it or have anything to do with it. They're describing this moment. They're speaking of this very moment, here and now. So how do we, how do we come to receive them, you know, right here and now into our very own 
life and experience and existence and all that we are just here and now this is <laughs> this is well the fact is you know in some sense perhaps it sort of ought to be easy but it isn't that easy and that's why we have a practice like this that you know can go on for decades and once we you know once we really start to sort of get it we we won't want to stop doing it because um it, it's so it's clearly so important that we be truly alive and the more sort of tastes we have of what of how alive we can be or what being alive can mean how 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 broad and 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 all encompassing a thing it can be to be alive so much more so than we ever realized the more we want to practice it's not like we get it and we're done i mean that's that's a a hazard <laughs> to think that way i've fallen foul of that myself I, a couple of times I had in earlier life had some sort of glimpse of the way and without really knowing what it was, or, you know, putting a name to it, but glimpse of a full resolution of a full, a complete fulfillment of life, which is what it offers. And thought, first time I thought, what on earth was that? And, you know, and my life's effectively done. I thought, I felt, you know, and, 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 um, all was resolved and, and things unfolded the way they did beyond that, rather differently, actually, <laughs> what I first thought. But then the second time I actually had been doing some Zen practice for a, quite a while and something happened that showed, I saw, I discovered, I, you know, discovered I, I was the way, you know, so simple just by not really having a sense of self, you know, finding, I am the way. The way is what I am. What a huge, marvelous relief. And I thought, phew, basically, excuse my language, thank God I can leave Zen now. That's sort of what I thought. <laughs> All this hard sitting. <laughs> Don't have to do it anymore. I got it. I got Zen, you know, <laughs> was really what I felt. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, uh, sorry to admit this, you know. But, you know, um, and again, how wrong I was, because number one, the way just doesn't stop. And there's a certain sense also in which it never starts. It's on one that perhaps on the sort of deepest level is it just it just doesn't do anything. It can't. Perhaps that's true. But at the same time, on another level, it's constantly functioning, constantly giving, it doesn't stop. So you never, you never get it, you know. And, um, and actually the process of Zen training, which can be, of course, can be quite quite grueling with the long hours of sitting. I mean, first of all, um, it's maybe not as necessary for it to be as grueling as they used to insist. I mean, Sambo Zen, over these decades of its interaction with the West going back to 1940s, or maybe even a bit earlier, um, you know, has, softened and softened and softened and we now have a a way that for some old timers would seem really too soft you know we only sit seven to eight hours a day on a, on a retreat and some would think that's shockingly slack but we found i think consistently that it is enough it just is enough and more and more it may maybe it'll even get a little bit easier and nothing will be lost and it's really really good to be discovering this that this way doesn't have to be harsh actually um i mean it's true that you know we need to um well one way or another 
we, I mean, the old idea was that because you've got to be in some way released from, we've, we need to be released from our sense of self. Somehow we need to be. And so the old idea was beat it down, beat it down, crush it, you know, <laughs> just treat it mercilessly. And eventually it'll sort of, it'll be defeated. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I'm being a bit sort of, I'm overstating things, but, but the, the, the more seasoned way that seems to be emerging is, no, that's not right. Um, allow, allow, allow. Let everything be. And by letting everything be, everything has this intrinsic capacity to release itself. Rather than the stick, you know, that was part of Zen training in the old days, and sort of knocking it and hammering it until it shatters. No, not necessary, actually. Just be still, be quiet, and find out how to let everything be, and then let everything be, and allow and allow, and things drop away by themselves. That's the way. Now, at the same time also, it's true that to find the amazing peace that can come or can be you know, uncovered in sitting, we, we do sometimes have to sort of push through barriers of restlessness and, and, um, and of, um, you know, different kinds of sort of tension and holding that really um, seems only the long softening of deep sitting will help those things give way. And they will in their own good time. So there's a place for, I'm not saying, you know, we don't need to do some more sitting than we might like to, but we, um, it's just, it doesn't need to be harsh. So this, I mean, this weekend is a good example, actually. We have, um, you know, relatively sort of light schedule, but on the other hand, it's a full schedule. I mean, it's enough to really immerse especially when we're doing it together. I mean, together in quotes, you know, but we sort of are doing it together, actually, as, as I hope you're all feeling. So, <clears throat> ordinary mind is the way, says Nansen, and I want to pick up the dialogue again. Joshu asks, what is the way? Nansen, his first teacher, really pretty much kind of his only teacher. I mean, he does go to other teachers later in life, but none for anything like the serious training he underwent with Nansen. So he asks, what is the way? Nansen answers, ordinary mind is the way. I mean, maybe just to give a broader sense of that, I'm, I'm saying ordinary experience is the way, just so you get a sense of it. And Joshu then asks, should I direct myself toward it or not? Nansen said, if you try to turn toward it, you go against it. Joshu asked, if I don't try to turn toward it, how can I know that it is the way? Nansen answered, the way does not belong to knowing or not knowing. Knowing is delusion, not knowing is a blank consciousness. When you have really reached the true way beyond all doubt, you will find it as vast and boundless as outer space. How can it be talked about on a level of right and wrong? At these words, Joshu was suddenly enlightened. Okay, that's the whole koan. It's sort of 
in a way got several koans in it, really. Um, this dialogue, the, the, the Joshu apparently was 18 at the time, and just started his training under Nansen. Um, he was born in 778, so that's why I was guessing this must have been about 796. And, you know, as many of you know, Joshu lived until 898, 120 years. Um, there was apparently quite a lot of longevity in, in China and in the Chan communities in those days um, because they lived a very healthy life in these healthy mountain valleys, growing their own food. And I think also probably because there was a, you know, one of the features of Taoism was sort of search for a long life. And so in a certain way, maybe you know, the Zen picked up some of the Taoist tricks, as it were, for, for longevity. Um, and his, just a little note on his biography, he started training at the age of 18, was with Nansen for 40 years. Nansen was 57 when Joshu died. He then spent three years still at Nansen's monastery observing obsequies, rites of um, remembrance for Nansen. And then he went off wandering for 20 years. And what he said apparently about his wandering was that if he met a seven-year-old child who could teach him, he would become their student. And if he met a 100-year-old person who wanted to learn from him, he would teach them. In other words, he was, you know, totally open to being guided and to offering guidance where appropriate and where asked for. completely open-hearted approach to wisdom. Offering it when asked to, as he can, receiving it wherever he can, from wherever. You know, one of our vows in the four great vows, or we could Another translation, actually, I might bring in to our Zendo, I think is not four great vows, but four great aspirations. Um, I rather like that, but one of them is the Dharma gates are countless. There are just unnumbered Dharma gates. I vow or I aspire to learn, master, enter them all. Wherever there's a Dharma gate, I will enter it. Wherever there's a, a lintel, you know, door lintel to pass under, I will pass under it. You know, you don't, these Dharma gates, um, you know, somehow we always have to stoop, I think, to go under them, through them. You're not gonna bash through <laughs> you know you you gotta generally you gotta go down to hope to get through them and i think you know maybe i still actually have a feeling that to that, that there's some key dharma gate that we can all find at somewhere along the way where it's very very small indeed i think of it as being like a boson and you somehow you've got to go through it how, how can you possibly do that? What a preposterous idea, Henry. Don't say such stupid, crazy things. But I somehow honestly, truthfully believe that, that there is a way that we have to pass through basically nothing somewhere along the way. Well, we don't have to, but there's a possibility of it. And, I, you know, of course, I don't understand it at all, but I have a feeling that that's a thing that can sort of happen to us where we're just, we're just sucked away through nothing. 
and it's the most marvelous thing you might think doesn't sound so good to be sucked away through nothing no thanks you know but actually <laughs> somehow it's an incredibly good thing the most most amazingly beneficial thing um so <clears throat> Coming back to the words of the koan, should I direct myself toward it or not? I mean, you know, I suppose all of us here in some sense are or have been seekers. You know, we, 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 we're like Joshua, what is the way? We know, we feel, we intuit that there is sort of some other way of experiencing life and this moment there is some other way how do i and you know that's what i'm looking for i hear stories of you know of people who sort of been through something that has that has changed their sense of life so that they're generally you know less troubled by the three poisons maybe not perfectly but generally less troubled by them and, and, and are motivated by different things and, um, and seem to have some sense of there being, um, you know, a greater peace that is accessible, that is possible. Again, maybe not consistently, but, but generally, and they sort of know of it. So, you know, um, how... How can I, I'm interested in that, you know, I'm seeking that, I want that, I want, maybe I've had a little taste, I want more, you know, what is the way? You know, that's, that's the basic question of the seeker. You know, and Nancy's response is ordinary experience. And then, well, that's, hold on. I mean, that's ordinary experience is going on now. So, so you know, so, um, okay, so maybe that's right, but how do I direct myself toward it? How do I turn toward it? How do I find it? I'm seeking something. How do I find it? What is it? Excuse me. Should I direct myself toward it or not? Surely I've got to do something because I'm looking for something. It is some kind of finding, searching. Nansen's answer, if you try to turn toward it, you go against it. If you try to find it, you're actually going the wrong way already. If you're looking for it, then you're looking in the wrong place. I mean, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? You know, so Joshi said, well, if I don't try to turn toward it, how can I know it's the way? Meaning, you know, if I'm not trying to find it, how can I ever find it? How, how will I ever know if I found it? And then Nansen makes this great statement. The way does not belong to knowing or not knowing. The way, in other words, is, is can't be known and it can't be not known. It can't be known and it can't not be known. And one, one possible kind of sort of thought experiment, I suppose, that might convey something of this here is, is like, um, you know, we're in a we're living in a 3D view, a 3D conditioned sense of things, three-dimensional. 
we're just not within that view we just can't possibly experience fourth fifth or sixth dimension because we're, we're simply in our 3d view but i mean forgetting about fourth dimension being time just forget that for now what about if there's a fourth dimension that's somehow also sort of spatial but it's already here but we've got a three-dimensional view, so we simply can't experience it. But if you take that to the, the 2D, 3D story, some of you would have heard this, you know, if, if beings are living in a two-dimensional world, a plane and a sphere, a ball, three-dimensional object passes through it, what they see is a point appearing and growing and growing, becoming a larger and larger circle, and then shrinking again, becoming a smaller and smaller circle. That's what they see. They don't see the 3D object passing through. It gets converted into a two-dimensional phenomenon. Well, what if the way is like that? We're in a three-dimensional experience, and the way is a four or five or six-dimensional object. And it's just always here. It's always here constantly, you know. But we've got our 3D view, so we just can't. We're never going to find it with the 3D view. No matter how much we search, it won't help us. Somehow, what has to happen is that our 3D view breaks down. Our 3D view, like a shell, gets sort of broken by something greater, if you see what I mean, like something hatching, you know, like a chick hatching out of a shell, like the, 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 four, the fourth D, the fifth D thing is here right now, but we can't receive it because we're stuck in our 3D shell of experience. So the way we experience has to change to show it, not what we experience. See what I mean? It's not a matter of like, I've got to just experience something else. No, it's the, you know, like, let me find another object. That'll be it, another thing. Isn't the way of thing, it sounds like it. There's some kind of thing, I just got to find it. Got to figure out, is it in the Himalayas? Is it in the Andes? You know, it's got to be in a mountain range. That's the, that's the place where these great wisdom treasures lurk. I got to get up the mountain and find it, it's over there. I'll get on a plane, I'll get on a boat, get on a bus, get on a train, and I'll find it, or I'll walk a long way and find it, you know. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. I mean, it just reminds me of Genscher, who, you know, been studying Zen for quite a while, ninth century, and getting nowhere, not, not, not finding the way, wanting to find the way, not finding it. So eventually gave up, so I'm leaving. So he was studying under Seppo, so he puts on his, travel pack and walks out off I'm going out of the out of the valley up over the mountain to another monastery I'll, I'll try there you know and he's on his way on his first day out and stubs his toe and so you all know the story some of you do and stubs his toe really badly you know it's said to maybe even one record says it exploded blood everywhere nasty imagine sandal stomping along fast you know damn it i've got to find the way i'm sick of this you know maybe i'm going to give up i'm going to give up on this stupid wayfinding business i've got better things i can do with my life you know let me just get back to work and i don't know get a good career together or <laughs> who knows what what he's going to do but off he's going you know maybe impatient frustrated walking fast bam slams his toe into a rock it's it's actually quite a good Zen story in the sense that there's a few wisdom points in it. One is that giving up, giving up really sometimes is the best thing we can do. Just giving up. I don't know what to do. I'm not allowed to try. Look at Joshu. If I try to turn toward it, if I don't, if I, should I try to turn toward it or not? 
No, if you try to turn toward it, you're, you're going the wrong way. Well, well, what am I supposed to do? What about not trying? So Gensha gives up. Also, he's pacing along, not really heeding in a certain sense not heeding <laughs> ordinary mind you know everyday experience walking walking he's sort of maybe a little lost in thought fuming as he stomps up the mountain and bam everyday mind hits him the rock slams into his tongue well when that happens he he has his great awakening his 3D view, his self and other view, is shattered, like cracking an egg on a rock. He gets broken. He gets broken and he's gone. And he goes back to Sepa and says, um, here I am, you know. And Sepa says, what are you doing back here? Why are you back? I thought you were leaving. And his comment is, um, Bodhidharma never took a single step. And Bodhidharma is the, is the, you know, the Indian sage who brought this awakening, direct awakening experience, the mind and heart of Buddha and of Kanzayon and of all love, all pervasive love. Bodhidharma brought it, in quotes, from India to China. Long journey, 3,000 mile journey, all the way around the coast of India, all the way around those long peninsulas like Malaya to the, to the south coast of China um, in, the, in the 500s. So Bodhidharma made a long journey, you know, partly by boat, yes, but also on foot, a lot of steps, a lot of walking. And, but what Gensha has just seen makes him say, Bodhidharma never took a single step. See, isn't that a perfect expression of this 3D view? Shattered. Shattered. Because when that's gone, there's nowhere to go. You go, you go wherever you like, but you never go anywhere. This is what we hear in the last part of the koan. When you've truly found the way beyond all doubt, you find it as vast and boundless as outer space. By the way, I'm reading today from this very first edition of Yamada Cohen's Gateless Gate, uh, which came out in from the LA Zen Center in um, 1979, Zen Center of Los Angeles, put it out. That was back in the day when, um, uh, yes, it's simply called Center Publications, 1979. And um, that, you know, that was when, um, <clears throat> sorry, I've just forgotten his name. Um, Mazumi Roshi was still alive and had been teaching Zen in America for, I'm guessing maybe, maybe he, he was here for about 20 years, I think. I think he died around 1990. So ZCLA was sort of going strong right then. It ran into some trouble, alas, in the mid eighties. Um, Mazumi Roshi was, was not really a, sort of in part was a Sambo Zen teacher. He, he actually was, um, you know, from a Soto lineage family. His dad was a, a Soto Zen master in Japan. And so was his brother. 
and he was ordained or whatever in that lineage. And then, but he decided like some other Soto masters in the mid 20th century, just he decided to study also in Rinzai with Koans. And he did that with one master, Kori Roshi. And then he did it with one of the Sambo Zen early teachers, uh, Yasutani Roshi. And actually he more or less used Yasutani Roshi's koan system with some slight adjustments, but basically he followed what, 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 what are the, San, the Sambo Zen koan, you know, system or curriculum, so to speak. Um, but in this edition, it's translated as, you'll find the way as vast and boundless as outer space. In a later edition, it was retranslated as, you'll find the way vast and boundless as the great empty firmament. And I want to just touch on a, a new translation that's come out from David Hinton, um, who is a China, Chinese scholar. He translates it like this. If you truly comprehend this way that never sets out for somewhere else, if you enter into it absolutely, you realize it's exactly like the vast expanses of this universe, all generative emptiness, you can see through into boundless clarity. I mean, you can hear it's, it's a little different, but it's also kind of similar. I love it. You realize it's exactly like the vast expanses of this universe. All generative emptiness, this emptiness that's generating all. You can see through into boundless clarity. So this is Nansen describing the way which is everyday ordinary experience. This moment, just like this, is the way. This moment, just like this, is exactly like the vast expanses of this universe. All generative emptiness you can see through into boundless clarity. So this is boundless clarity. This is all generative emptiness. This is, this is emptiness making everything. This right here, this right here. Boundless clarity, all making, empty, vast expanse. When you see this, you see it. When you see it, you see it. Bodhidharma said, Nothing holy, vast and void. Nothing holy, vast and void. Like this. Nothing holy, vast and void. Ordinary white feather. Little, vast, void, white, feather. This, this, this. Okay, okay, folks. Please enjoy, 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 enjoy your practice, enjoy your path, trust your path, your own path. There's only one and it's yours. 
There's only one and it is yours. It's your path. It's you. You are the way. The way is you. Okay. So let's have a short break and then resume our sitting. 